Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're going to be taking a look at Dark Fortresses and providing a basic building guide for the newly reworked Warrior of Chaos factions that will be coming alongside the Champions of Chaos DLC on August 23rd. Now, since not everyone who is going to be buying the new DLC will own both Warhammer 1 and 2, for the majority of my coverage here, it will be centered around the Realm of Chaos campaign, or the default Warhammer 3 campaign, instead of Immortal Empires, even though much of this guide will be relevant for both. And starting things off, the Warrior of Chaos factions highlighted by these four new legendary lords in the DLC are not interested in empire building, with their main campaign objective being the race to 50,000 souls to open up the path to Jambai Jian, these champions prefer to sack settlements for more souls rather than occupy them like traditional factions. And the game design reflects this. As you can see, for most settlements in the game, there are only going to be two building slots, with very limited assortment of buildings for the second free slot with the exception of these designated Dark Fortresses, which builds out like a regular faction capital for most other factions in the game. And we'll be taking a look at the actual buildings available and some of the strategies you can use in terms of which buildings to go for as we proceed with this guide. But the first thing we're gonna make note is that these Dark Fortresses are denoted by these symbols on the campaign map. And some of them even come with a vassalage for a nearby Norskian tribe, especially the starting locations for the four legendary lords. And if we just zoom out, aside from this province which we own entirely, every other red mark on the map denotes a dark fortress site. And there are 32 of them scattered across the campaign map, as you see here. And if you're curious about which ones are available in what province, you can pause and take a look at the province list here. Every single one of these province capitals will be a Dark Fortress site, and there are 32 of them, as I mentioned before. We'll be using the Frozen Landing as our main target for this guide. And to kick things off, let's first start with the question, should we just take the Dark Fortress or should we complete the whole province as shown here? Well, the only bonus from completing it is access to commandments. There are going to be four available. Foster cults will give you additional corruption based on which of the mono gods you serve. There is also a construction cost discount for all buildings. It's decent. Then for exploit vassals, you will lose 4 points of control, you will gain 20% replenishment chance for Marauders of Corn in the local Warband recruitment, which is a new recruitment system that comes with the Warriors of Chaos rework. We'll have a full guide on the Warband system tomorrow, but in essence this is saying that there's a 20% extra chance you'll get one more recruitable Marauder of Corn added to your recruitment pool for the warbands, which we can briefly take a look at. So this is our army. This is the warband upgrade, but if we're going for warband recruitment, you see here there is a capacity of units and units available as well as a percentage chance will get another one of these unit every turn. So right now we hit our capacity, but let's say I recruit this unit. Then next turn, there's a 31% chance I'll get another one to recruit. The cap can be increased through technology, through uh, gifts, through buildings, but the chance here is what we're increasing with that commandment. So for Marauder of Corn, which we don't even have here, uh, we'll get an additional 20% chance to get a new one next turn. That's how the percentage work. In addition to that, there is also a construction cost discount. Now the control looks like a penalty, but I actually argue that lowering your control is actually preferred for these factions, especially in your starting area when your armies are nearby, because you can farm rebel factions for more souls, which is definitely helpful for the race to Jambai Jian. Then we have a defensive one called They Come to the Wrong Place, which has an assortment of penalties for enemy armies, reduction of attrition when your units are under siege, 
decrease enemy hero action success chance as well as melee defense for your armies in the province. Then we have a more offensive one called Legion of Hate. This reduces the chance of plague spreading, reduction of recruitment costs, and 5 points of melee attack. Overall, I think these bonuses are rather minor across the board and probably not worth going for the full completed province because you can have these as your vassals holdings and there are ways to increase income from them using your main building chains in your dark fortresses rather than building it out yourself. Since the default tier 1 provides no income, only gives you 5 garrison unit 1% replenishment rate and 3 points of your corresponding corruption, it's not very worth it. If you have a port, you have to build the port, it's locked. So for port settlements, you're looking at 20 points of growth, which is completely useless since there's no upgrade. It can contribute to your main settlement's growth, but 20 points not going to make or break anything. 5% additional replenishment does help and the 10% recruitment cost discount is nice and you get one capacity increase. It's nothing too grand here. If we look at a regular non-port county, then your option becomes even more limited. You have three altar improvements, replenishment boosts, which matches the port and also get a bit of winds of magic. You also have orban upgrade discount for the recruitment option, and then there's arcane option increasing item drop chance for all armies in adjacent regions. There is 15% additional soul gain. That one's okay, but overall, I think these are very, very minor bonuses that's not going to stack super well since you don't have that many adjacent regions. It's much better to raise these on your way to get more souls directly rather than build them up to get more souls in your next province, for example. Lastly, you can try to build the defensive builds to give three more units additional bonuses on defense. Not really worth it. Don't defend it if you don't take it. Coming to our Dark Fortress itself, the story is very different. Here you find everything that's very useful for the faction, including income, the base unit recruitment, which is still very important, even with Warband, because without the base unit unlocked, you can't upgrade them using the Warband upgrade mechanic. So you notice that for building chains such as the Marauder's Tribe here, you get assortment of base unit instead of more upgraded units of the same type. So we have a Marauder of Corn here, for example. Then we move on to a Cavalry unit and then a Chariot unit. So these are the base infantry, base cavalry, and the base chariot that you can upgrade from using the Warband. And that means for the more advanced military buildings, as well as some of the other basic buildings, the upgraded forms of the building must provide something additional for you to be enticed to upgrade them since you're no longer upgrading them to get unlocks of more advanced units. And we'll look at some of the rationale behind this. First things first, your settlements provide income. Your provincial capital at the highest tier will provide 1,000 income, or favors, as they are the income for the Chaos factions, in our case, Warriors of Chaos. We get all seven building slots, a bit of corruption, 12 units in a garrison, which is a decent size, 100 points of growth, which would be pretty useless at this point once we hit tier five, defensive supplies for under siege, alliance points, which is useful, because we will maintain some vassals, pretty easily just through the campaign mechanic to take advantage of the new sort of vassalage alliance system in the game where we can give them commands, take control of their armies, recruit some of their units and so forth. Then if we have a port, in this case in Frozen Landing we do, we'll get this replenishment bonus building with a bit of recruitment cost discount for Chaos Marauder units as well as a bit of growth which becomes a moot point at the final tier. We will be increasing the local warband unit capacity for the two types of unit unlocked by the port, which is nice. And then moving on to basic military, we already mentioned the unit being unlocked by Marauder's Tribe, but if you notice, the upgrade also gives you a recruitment cost discount, as well as additional capacity for the units that are related to the unlocks. For the Fighter's Lodge, we get a hero available, as well as the Chaos Warrior, which increases the capacity 
will get discounts to the warband upgrade themselves for all units, which is lovely. And then for the monsters, we have Chaos Trolls and Spawn of Corn, and we get Chaos Undivided Corruption added as well, and they will increase capacity as well as more corruption as you level up. Once you get to the advanced military buildings, you start seeing income boost on these building chains. We have favor increase. Favor is our income currency, all the way up to 25%. Increase rank for all units, which is actually very useful because for the ore band mechanic to work, you need to hit rank five before you can upgrade to the higher tier of units. So starting off with additional rank, help you get there faster. Now, there is going to be a separate guide on the entire Warband mechanic tomorrow, so if you're curious about how that works in detail, as we're just brushing through some of it right now, come back tomorrow for that guide. And if we move to the next building chain for Sorcery, we get another 50% increase from income, as well as another type of hero added here, the Sorcerers. Then finally, for the large monster building chain, more income, more chaos on Divided, all the monster buildings are going to be Chaos Undivided, Corruption Increase. We actually get a Chaos Giant in our garrison as well as additional recruitment capacity in our Warband for these buildings as well. Then moving on to Defense, uh, the Protection Building is going to be a lot less useful for us since in this DLC, if you're playing as any of the Warriors of Chaos factions, the Realm of Chaos campaign actually advanced forward in time. Urson's been saved by Kislev at this point, so no more Roars of the Dying Bear. And for most factions in the previous versions of the Realm of Chaos campaign, as well as you go play those factions after the DLC, you'll still be trying to save Urson and you'll still have to deal with Rifts. So that's the main use of protection building in that version of the base campaign. For us, that's trying to race towards this ancient city, we don't need to worry about rifts. The only rifts that will spawn are rifts that we open up after reaching certain thresholds of souls to help us move around the map. So the protection building chain, a lot less useful for us. The garrison building chain, however, is probably actually a lot more useful than you would think. Or I guess a lot of players like to build defensive buildings. I'm not one of those players. But for this type of campaign, I think they are pretty essential since they will give you up to eight units in your garrison, which will actually put you at 20 units, potentially 21 unit if you built the large monster fifth tier building as well. And that's going to help you defend against enemy armies as you will have these isolated dark fortresses littered across the map. AI faction is going to take the land near you and come challenge you. So having a good default garrison is going to be pretty crucial in how to defend your land. And this pretty much becomes a must build for your settlements here. Then we move on to infrastructure. There is surprisingly an actual income building chain here in the warship chain. We'll gain favor all the way up to a thousand as well as some faction wide post battle loot and sacking settlement bonuses. As I said, there are 32 of these dark fortress settlements. So you can get up to 128% post battle loot income and 128% sacking settlement income boost from these building chains, which is quite nice. There's also a growth building chain with some early casualty replenishment bonus that can be useful. This obviously becomes obsolete once you upgrade to the fifth tier so you can demolish it then save a spot for a military building. The last building here is the vassal building. As mentioned before, we talked about the vassal system, leaving them for the other counties as well as adjacent land. Makes sense because we can actually boost the income from them in that case. A little bit of control, which I don't actually like. Uh, basically, if the area is still contested early on, I would stay away from this. Your army's nearby, farm some rebels, it helps a lot to get more souls. Later on, if you have the area pretty flushed out, your vassals are strong and they control the regions near you, then perhaps building this vassals building chain is going to help you with additional income as well as the spread of your corruption and a bit of control in case you don't want to fight rebels, even though with a full garrison plus a defensive building, 
I think they can beat back any rebel force, so it's just free souls all the time, which never hurts. And in essence, with 7 free slots, if you don't have a port, it's pretty straightforward in my opinion, it's going to be the income building, the garrison defense building, and all your military buildings. And that's going to be your sort of uh, 7 slots. Well. You can't have all six here, but all three advance, and then two of whichever ones you want here, depending on what type of unit you're going for. But the advanced ones sums up to 100% additional income. With 2,000 base, you're looking at 4,000 income per settlement, which is actually pretty good and can definitely help you afford some armies compared to most base game factions. So the income from Warrior Chaos is not bad. Your Dark Fortresses are just spread across the map, as you see here. And there are certain areas that's pretty dead. Uh, for example, uh, the Ogre territory doesn't have any Dark Fortresses, which I guess makes sense. And then the Vampire area also doesn't have any. There's a couple in the Empire, but not that many. There's a new map edition where Festus actually starts. So that's going to have one. Uh, not surprisingly, a lot of them are in the chaos areas that we start with. There are two in Cathay, or actually three. The capital of Weijing, Nangao, the capital for uh, Maoying, as well as Shangyang. Uh, technically the capital of Zhao Ming, even though he starts out in Hanyu Port. So that's going to be pretty much everything you need to know about Dark Fortresses, as this is going to be your main settlement and building setup for any of the warrior of chaos factions in the realm of chaos campaign and hopefully you find this helpful and definitely come back tomorrow as we'll explore the new warband upgrade Stops. system which everyone's super excited about coming to these war of chaos factions and then the day after we'll the do a guide on technology which is shared the between the four factions even though they will get different icons and different stat bonuses on these tech as they are going to be specialized for each of the chaos gods even though the structure that you see here will remain the same so that would be an interesting guide because you actually cover this tech tree four times with different tech um, so stay tuned for that and finally before launch the last four days we'll be doing a faction preview for the starts of each of these factions to see which one might fit your playstyle the most on the Not day of launch so and we'll see you guys then snow. bye